What if I was to tell you that you, yes, speaking to you, may be oversaturating your mixes and not even realising it? Oh, no. Okay, okay. So explain to me, right, why you are using so many analogue emulations then. Uh, because the sound of analogue is harmonic distortion, digital sounds shit, Analog sounds the best. Uh, duh. God. Right, okay, okay. So you're telling me the more analog emulations and saturation plugins that you add in your DAW, that's going to make your mix sound more analog and subjectively better. Yeah, well, that's just obvious. God. All the pros add warmth and colour to their mixes. That's why their mixes sound best. And that's why analog. Sounds the best. God. Right, okay, so what if I was to tell you that analogue hardware isn't actually as distorted as what you think it is? Actually, a lot of the stuff's actually quite clean. Lies, lies, oh God, lies. You're not a pro. Lies. Well, let's test it out then. So first off, we'll have a look at a few modern mastering grade hardware units so you can see that the API 5500 and Rupert Neve Master Bus Processor with the red silk function on, just how extremely clean they are to the point where the harmonics can be classed by many as inaudible as it looks to be under minus 100 dB full scale. But what if we were to look at a more vintage unit, say a Pultec, which uses tubes? Surely that will give us more colour. It's tubes, right? That's, that's what you'd think anyway. Well, yes, it does, but it's still under minus 100 dB full scale. Now, what's interesting to me is that the Warm Audio Pultec clone actually makes more harmonic distortion than the real deal with one order of harmonic creeping into our audible range which looks to be around minus 90, minus 80 dB full scale. However, that is just EQs that we've looked at so far. When it comes to compressors, like especially vintage compressors, it is a different ballgame as components have changed and gain staging kind of, kind of goes out the window a little bit as say with a 1176. The compression is completely input dependent as it has a fixed threshold. So the more compression you require, the more you need to crank your input, which raises the voltage of the signal, which from the P42 video that I did a couple of weeks ago, we know that pushing an input transformer creates more harmonic distortion. Look what happens when we compress 5 dB with 1176 using a fast attack and release. The input transformer being pushed harder in combination with the FET compression results in more harmonic distortion and more importantly, more audible harmonic distortion with a lot of low order harmonics hitting somewhere around minus 30 or minus 40 dB full scale and a lot of higher order harmonics hitting around the minus 60 dB mark. I mean, just look at that second harmonic. That's strong harmonics and you can hear that colour when you compress hard with an 1176. And then when you think about like um, a very popular vocal chain, right, when people add an LA-2A in series, so they'll add an LA-2A after an 1176, we can see that the LA-2A makes more orders of harmonics, again, lower order harmonics being the most prominent around minus 40 dBFS, but still at least seven or eight audible orders of harmonics added stretching to the top end of the frequency spectrum. So as we can see, there is a massive difference in harmonic distortion when using a hardware EQ compared to vintage analog compressors. Which is why if we take CLA as an example, he'll simply go straight to the SSL board after his 1176 and LA 2A compression, and that's really it done. And if these analog guys do add a compressor on the 2 bus, which many do, it is relatively low in harmonic distortion. You just need to have a look at the SSL G bus compressor set relatively slow, doing around like 2 dB of compression. As you can see, some audible harmonics in the lower regions of the spectrum, but mostly pretty clean overall. Now, you do have some analog bus compressors like the Manly Verimu set relatively uh, the same at say like 2 dB gain reduction that add more colour which in this case is a strong first order harmonic 
but still just one audible order of harmonic, which reduces in level the higher it climbs up the frequency spectrum. It's nowhere near the harmonic distortion of an 1176 or LA-2A. And the reason why I'm showing you this is to remind you that there is a reason why many modern hardware units are lower in harmonic distortion than many believe. Because you also have to remember that harmonic distortion builds up over a mix and the overall level of distortion is dictated by the amount of harmonic distortion on each track. As an example, right, let's say we have 10 minus dBFS sweeps all going to the master, which is hitting like minus 6 dBFS as I've brought down the level of each track per 6 dB, right? Have a look at the printed master with 10 tracks summed to it with only one UED API plugin instance on one track. Now look at how the overall harmonic level rises with 5 API instances. And then on all 10 tracks with an API instance on every track. As you can see, the 10 instances have built up and created an overall level of harmonic distortion which is now falling within our audible threshold. So whilst the API instance on its own doesn't really create any audible harmonics, multiple instances of it does. So it starts to make a lot of sense why a lot of analog gear is designed to be as clean as possible. The more gear you use, the more tracks you have, the more saturated and noisier your overall record will be and you can tell that this was something the engineers cared about and listened for as the gear became cleaner over the years. And also, when I mean, you think about the birth of the SSL consoles, which created the industry standard for mixing engineers. And guess how it was designed? It was designed to be an extremely clean and transparent mixing desk. So, harmonic distortion has always been something that needed managed within the analogue domain. It was seen as something to limit and control as it was an unchangeable side effect of analog equipment. That's why Pro Tools in the development of the digital era was so heavily pushed, so engineers had the choice of how much harmonic distortion and noise they allowed onto a mix. Well now, we seem to have the opposite problem, where we want to add more harmonic distortion because we believe that it's what makes a record sound analog. And a lot of algorithmic plugins these days seem to have cottoned on to this and have decided to crank up the heat to give the audience what they think that they want. A good example of this is the real tech from Noise Ash. Right? Just look at the harmonic distortion it adds just running through it, right? Compared to two analog Pultex. The real Pultex don't add anywhere near that amount of harmonic distortion, but we'll stick the real tech on top of other plugins as I want that Pultec colour. When in reality, a real Pultec is actually not adding that much colour. But if it sounds good, then it sounds good. I hear you I hear you shouting at me. And my question back to you would be, do you understand the sound of like saturation? Do you know if your mix is oversaturated? Have you ever compared one of your mixes completely clean versus a mix that you've done that's used tons of analog emulations and saturation? Have you ever taken both mixes, level matched them and compared them side by side? Because in my opinion, and again this is subjective, I kind of feel when it comes to saturation and harmonic distortion, there's kind of like this line, it's a fine line between adding vibe, adding more perceived loudness, adding a little bit more forwardness and aggression to Right, you're making things smaller. If we think back to the RS-124 video, right? How we said like the RS-124 vocal kind of sat back at the mix, right? Where the clean vocal kind of came out a little bit more. What you'll find is that when you add in lots of saturation to lots of different things, you'll end up adding more and more saturation. And what you'll do is you'll add more saturation to say like the guitars and drums and the bass to kind of counter the saturation that you've probably added to the vocals so the vocal stands out a little bit more. Then what that does is that overall it just results in quite an oversaturated and small sounding mix. And after that video it just kind of got me thinking more and more and more about the actual sound of harmonic distortion and how you'll notice that the pros, when they do add analog emulations and saturation, it is kind of more by taste and it's not just because they need to do it. The reason that they do it is because they feel that certain source needs it and they won't go over every single track, right? For example, right, let's think about Serban Gunnar, right? Probably the best, like, celebrated mixing engineer of all time. His engineer, John Haynes, he isn't shy in telling you that, like, Serban is fully in the box and interestingly enough, like, they don't use, like, any, like, console-style plugins 
to get like a console vibe. They actually use like the metric Halo channel strip, which if you check it out, it's extremely clean. Actually, the EQs are like completely linear. The compressor that's in the channel strip that they do use quite a lot creates harmonic distortion, but again, it's a compressor, but again, it's not adding that much harmonic distortion. It's actually a pretty clean channel strip. And the reason that they use it is because they love the workflow of it. It's just easy for them to get to where they need to be. And if you think about the analog domain, as I said earlier, going from like, say like tracking on an Eve, and through all the pre's and all the gear and all the compression, going to an SSL, which is extremely clean. There was obviously some harmonic distortion built up from the SSL, but check out the SSL plugins. They're extremely clean. And if you check out a lot of pros on Mix with the Masters, and actually just generally a lot of pro engineers like showing us like um, snippets of like their mixing sessions, you'll notice that a lot of them use SSL EQs. A lot of them use um, API EQs, which I've shown you are actually very clean. Like these EQs are extremely, extremely clean. So when we are looking at these pros and we see, oh, analog emulation, oh, analog emulation, API, SSL, it's actually, for me, it's actually more about the actual sonic character of like the frequency curves, like the filters themselves, more than like the analog vibe that you're getting, okay? Because there isn't actually that much like analog color being added. And going back to Serbian Guinea, there's actually a very interesting comment. I'll see if I could find it because somebody did send it to me. And it was along the lines of John Haynes. And I remember there was a comment that he made where he was talking about analog emulations. And when he was talking about like what I listened to in a mix, he was actually made a comment talking about listening to the mix, thinking, is there actually too many analog emulations on this mix? And what I love about this is that it shows that these pro engineers are actually listening to how everything that they add, right? how it affects the mix, how it contributes to the entire mix, how everything builds up together. It's very easy to get caught in the trap when you see all these guys with all this outboard gear, when in reality, the producers and the recording engineers are imprinting a lot of color that then goes to mixing engineers. And it isn't the mixing engineer's job to add that vibe and color. It's their job to mix and balance it and enhance the sound that's already been created by the producer, right? Remember, the producer sits with the artist. They create the sonic landscape, which then creates a rough, which then goes to a mixing engineer. In regards to my mixing, I mix actually relatively re really clean now, which will surprise people because I'm Paul Third and I love all this geeky analog emulation stuff. But I'm just very, very selective. And at the end of the day, it is all subjective. And I'm not telling you what to do. You do what you do, I do what I do. There's a lot going on on YouTube just now about you should be doing this and there are rules and you should be doing that and you shouldn't be doing this. This whole thing about like you, like you shouldn't be mixing into a limiter. What a, lot of what a lot of bullshit. Like do what you want. I mix into a limiter because I understand why I mix into a limiter. My mentor kind of taught me, think about when you've got a mix, right? You've got a certain level of saturation. It sounds great in the mix, okay? Now you imagine when you send that to a mastering engineer, right? You've given that mastering engineer like minus 6 dBFS of headroom. He takes that mix and over limits it to like minus 8, minus 6, minus 4 luffs. And you remind yourself that limiting is like heavy, heavy, heavy compression, right? Infinity ratio. So your loudest parts become quieter and your quieter parts become louder. So in theory, the harmonic distortion that might not be audible when you were mixing may come up during the limiting process. Because if we go back to all the sweeps and I talk about um, the level of the actual harmonics and saying, right, look, it's on the cusp of being audible. If you were to compress that and you bring those lower level harmonics then it's gonna become audible. So why not mix through a limiter so you can make those decisions knowing that the final result is going to be a level of saturation that you are happy with. But either way, right, I'm not telling you to mix into a limiter. You do what you want. Because in the end, a lot of it is just fucking bullshit at the end of the day. Like this bullshit that pros um, don't mix in to a limiter. John Haynes, right, you can find it, right, I'll actually leave it here. Serban Guinea's own engineer mixes into a limiter. But just because Serban Guinea's engineer and possibly Serban Guinea mix into a limiter doesn't mean that you need to do it. But in the end, it's worth giving it a try 
and having an understanding of why some of these guys mix into limiters and why some of these guys don't add as much saturation and understanding the sound of saturation and actually going back to mixes and going, right, let's try it a little bit cleaner. No, I do prefer it with more saturation. Okay, that's fine. Let's go with it. I'm not telling you what to do and I never ever want to be that guy that tells you what to do. This is just a discussion with me being me, being geeky as shit as always. For me, I just feel like I have more control now and I am hearing clarity that I wasn't hearing before because I was just oversaturating everything and I was adding in too many analog emulations. But either way, it is completely subjective. I'm not a pro, I don't claim to be a pro. This is just a conversation. So, either way, are you oversaturating your mixes? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Try it out, experiment, and let me know how you got on. Right? My name's Paul Third. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next week.